Hello everyone, thank you very much for tuning into our webinar this afternoon. The theme for this afternoon is Andrology. We're going to be focusing on optimising the preparation of sperm. We're just letting in delegates from the waiting room and we'll start this webinar in one minute. Good afternoon and a warm welcome to our webinar this afternoon. The theme for this afternoon is andrology. We're going to be focusing on optimising the preparation of sperm. I'm Emily Austin, Managing Director of Cooper Surgical Fertility Solutions in the UK and Ireland. Joining us today, we're delighted to have Stacey McPherson. Stacey joined the field of clinical embryology in 2010, shortly after completing a master's degree in biological sciences at the University of Sheffield. Stacey has worked in both the public and private sector. Stacey completed the race certificate and HCPT registration whilst working for the NHS at Cambridge IVF. Stacey then joined Care Fertility, where she progressed from clinical embryologist to deputy lab laboratory manager. Stacey served as webmaster for the UK Association of Clinical Embryologists for four years. Stacey joined Cooper Surgical in June 2021 as the clinical application scientist for the UK and Ireland. In her new role, Stacey provides clinical support, training and education for customers. We're also very pleased to have Dr. Dave Morrill joining us this afternoon. Dave has worked as a clinical embryologist since 1986, training in Manchester, where he also completed his PhD studies. He has managed several laboratories in the UK, including being responsible for the designs of labs in Leeds and Daresbury. He joined Origio as Director of Embryology in, 2000, in November 2011, becoming Director of Clinical Support for Cooper Surgical in January 2019. Dave previously served as chair of the UK Association of Clinical Embryologists and Association of Biomedical Andrologists, as well as being involved with several working groups, notably the HFEA expert group on multiple births after IVF. In his current role, Dave is part of Cooper Surgical's global professional educational clinical support team, providing technical and scientific support, as well as education and training. His specific responsibility for lab designs, clinical trials and lab audits. And we have a very special guest this afternoon. I'm very pleased to say that Dr. Matt Tomlinson has joined us this afternoon. Matt is a consultant scientist in andrology and as a lead expert in his field, Matt has over 30 years experience with NHS assisted conception services, also as a lecturer and teacher for master's levels courses and as a trainer for professional bodies. His experience started with running laboratory courses for the British Andrology Society and then the Association of Biomedical Andrologists, a group he co-founded. Matt has been a peer assessor for accreditation and expert witness for a number of high profile legal cases, a reviewer for a number of journals and grant awarding bodies and has over 50 peer reviewed papers and book chapters. His main areas of interest are assessing and preparing, validating and verifying procedures with a view to accreditation, risk management of diagnostic and therapeutic services, sperm banking services and developing automation in semen analysis. He's an advocate for evidence-based diagnostics and treatment for infertility. And Matt, you can also add to this uh, prestigious biography that you've attracted the highest number of delegates ever to a Cooper Surgical U-based webinar. So thank you very much for that. Pairing our webinar this afternoon is a regular guest to our webinars, Dr. Steve Troop. With nearly 35 years experience in fertility and a PhD in male infertility, Steve has risen through the ranks to have been the scientific, scientific director of Liverpool Women's Hospitals, Hewitt Fertility Centres, and more recently, IVI's UK centres. As well as his day-to-day -day operational, managerial and research responsibilities in both the NHS and private sectors, Steve has often provided advice to regulatory bodies, educators, the commercial sector and colleagues around the world. He is particularly proud to have been both chair and president of the Association of Clinical Embryologists and a founder member of the newly formed Association <coughs> of Reproductive and Clinical Scientists. Steve now works independently as a consultant reproductive scientist based in the UK. We have a, a few international delegates with us today, which is wonderful. You're most very welcome to join us from wherever you may be based around the world. However, any references that we make or questions that we cover about regulation will be based on the UK and Ireland. If you have questions at any point, please enter them into the Q&A box. We love to get your questions, so please ask away. We will pose these questions to our panel after the presentations. Thank you very much for your attention. Steve, welcome. I'll now hand over to you. 
Well, thanks very much, uh, Emily. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for asking me to take part in this webinar. Um, just by way of a, a quick in introduction, um, I'm, I'm sure most in the audience will be familiar with this so-called marginal gains approach to improving systems. And this approach is, is essentially where, uh, where small improvements are, um, are, are, are small improvements and optimizations are made to each minute component of a system. And although the individual improvements may themselves be un unnoticeable, when they're all added together, um, a significant improvement can be achieved. And there's absolutely no reason why this approach can't be applied to the work that we do. And indeed, um, as we're constantly on, concentrating on today to sperm preparation. Um, but just before handing over to Matt, um, I'd like to suggest something and that is that with with the exception of of perhaps some surgically recovered sperm samples or um, samples which are um, very severely oligo or asthenosospermic um, where we have only a handful of sperm to play with the majority of samples that we handle um, in, in an IVF lab on a day-to-day -day basis um, almost have a, a built-in redundancy factor because we, we simply have so many sperm to go at and, you know, you, you, you sometimes hear phrases like, uh, oh, just um, we'll get another sample, don't worry about it, or, um, you know, leave the sperm prep until you've finished the, uh, until you've finished the, the vitrification of those blastocysts, or, you know, just get another straw out, this sort of thing. So I, I do wonder sometimes whether this might make us pay slightly less attention to the way that we handle uh, and prepare sperm than, than we should. So uh, perhaps with that in mind, I'll, I'll hand over to Matt uh, and ask him to give us his views on, on routine uh, sperm preparation for ART. Thanks, Matt. You, you're muted, Matt. Thanks, Steve, and thanks, Emily, and thanks to Coopers for inviting me to do this. Um, Yes, we're going to be talking mainly about commonly used procedures for sperm preparation, but we will touch on one, one or two other um, areas as well. The first should um, uh, um, talk about a conflict of interest that I, a potential conflict of interest that I have in that I am involved with a company that is developing software and sells software for, for computer assisted semen analysis. Um, and, and that will be a focus of one or two of these slides that we're going to give. So we are talking about established methods for sperm preparation. So essentially, we're going to focus on density gradient centrifugation. Uh, we'll talk a bit about the swim up and we will touch on a microfluidic um, variant, uh, so-called variant on, on a swim up or a swim up, basically a swim up chip. We'll talk a little bit about trying to optimize conventional sperm preparation methods, touch on the story on the effect that centrifugation may have on the generation of free oxygen radicals and a possible cause of oxidative stress on sperm. And we will touch uh, on a few slides looking at how we measure performance in testing our sperm preparation media, validating the media, looking at specifically at density gradient centrifugation media and our sperm wash resuspension buffers. So what are the principles of sperm separation and preparation? Well, to start with, we can use that unique character of sperm, which is motility, and we can separate sperm using that property. So the first, uh, principle we use is a chance migration and you will have seen this in the swim up method and some have described a swim down method and some have even described a swim up through a semi-permeable membrane and then there's a forced migration uh, and this is really principles that are, uh, underlie some of the more developmental methods so swimming towards a chemo attractant swimming against the fluid flow so rheotaxis and then there have been some methods described which talk about swimming with a temperature gradient because sperm are attracted to higher temperatures. And then we can talk about separation based on density. And this is our density gradient separation, which we 
recognized widely as our industry standard. And that's because the most dense sperm do sediment more quickly. And it just so happens that those sperm with the highest density also have the highest motility. They have improved DNA quality and improved sperm morphology. So why do we need to se uh, separate sperm in the first place? Well, for a start, we need to remove the seminal plasma and the non-sperm cells from the semen and get them away from the sperm. We need to remove dead and dying sperm, which could generate free radicals as they degenerate. And because seminal plasma is biochemically complex, it contains things like prostaglandins, proteins, enzymes, and trace elements. And it also might contain microorganisms, none of which have a place inside the female reproductive tract. Seminal fluid also prevents capacitation, which is the process sperm undergo uh, during the acquisition of fertilizing capacity. And seminal plasma needs to be removed to allow capacitation to take place. And what we want to do is create a certain sperm suspension like this, which is enriched with more motile sperm, sperm with higher velocity, sperm that are more morphologically normal and have higher DNA quality. And of course, that is used in our inseminate, whether it's in, in insemination or in during IVF. And we can use that to prepare sperm during freezing, before cooling. We can use it diagnostically. We can even use it for things like toxicity testing. So let's start with the swim up, which was first described by Lopata in 1976. And this is, as we described, a chance migration. So you've got your seminal fluid in the bottom of the tube here, and you layer over the top of that some culture media, or you can do what we call an underlayer. So you put your culture media in first, put a pipette down to the bottom of the tube, and put your seminal fluid underneath that. And the sperm over a period of up to an hour will swim up from the seminal fluid into the media layer. And to increase the yield from that preparation, you would just simply increase the incubation time. As an alternative to that, you might want to use what we call an indirect method, whereby the sample is washed to form a pellet, and then you layer over the pellet your sperm wash buffer or media. And that can also increase the yield slightly, although it does run the risk of having a, an inseminate that contains more immotile sperm. And that's basically it. It's effective, it's cheap to run, it's cost effective, and it's worked for many years. But what about density gradient centrifugation? Well, this was technology originally adapted from other areas of biomedicine, so separating blood cells, for example, and first described by Pertoff in the late 70s. And this used the properties of a colloid, colloidal silica in suspension, and relied on the fact that this is not a true solution. So what you could then do with that solution or colloid is add your own electrolytes and create a physiological pH and osmolality. And you can create layers of different densities according to the cell type that you want to separate. And of course, with time, the most dense cells will sediment to, to the bottom of the centrifuge tube. So the high density cells end up at the bottom of the tube lower density cells and non-sperm cells end up further up, higher up in the column or trapped at the interface of the density gradient. And what we do is we accelerate that procedure by centrifugation, and we can increase our yield by increasing either the centrifugation speed or increasing how long we want to centrifuge the sperm for. And this is the basic method, essentially. I would normally advocate using a one mil lower layer with a one mil upper layer on top. And as manufacturers normally say, up to three mils of seminal fluid on top of the column. Now you can create these layers in different ways. Some people prefer to layer gently on top of the lower layer, this low density layer. But what is, it tends to be easier, simpler to get a nice neat um, column is to put your lower layer, your low density layer in first, put your pipette to the bottom of the tube and put your high density layer in underneath. And then you can slowly trickle on your seminal fluid layer on top. 
My own opinion would be to not use up to three mils, but maybe limit this to two mils. Then you centrifuge this for, it says here between 300 and 500 G. Most manufacturers advocate a fairly gentle spin at between 250 and 300 G for about 20 minutes normally. And then you're left with this pellet at the bottom with your high density sperm. Your low density sperm could be all the way up the column and you tend to get your non-sperm cells and other sperms uh, trapped at the interface between the two layers. Then what you would do, you can remove this supernatant here right down to the pellet and discard it. Or as some manufacturers may advocate, you actually remove the pellet by putting a pipette down to the bottom of the tube taking that out and putting that into a clean tube. And then you can either wash this pellet once or twice at 300 G for five minutes. And manufacturers will state different methods, but there is no evidence to suggest that one is, is insufficient. And of course, you've got a balance between over centrifugation and getting a clean preparation. So because we've got sperm at the bottom of this pellet with higher density, it just so happens that they have improved motility, improved sperm swimming speed, but they also have improved morphology. The sperm tends to be more uniformly normal as in this picture here. And this is because they're more dense because their DNA is more tightly packaged and has fewer strand breaks, okay? And then you get lower density sperm higher up the gradient and your abnormally looking sperm, particularly sperm with what we call macrocephaly, so large sperm heads with lower density and poorer DNA packaging. Also higher up the column, you will get non-sperm cells, leukocytes, immature germ cells, and these are the cells with lower sperm density, and they will either be trapped at the interface between the two layers or higher up the column. Do we need to use two separate layers for our density gradient centrifugation? Do we need what we call a discontinuous density gradient centrifugation? Well, in other areas, such as in, in the veterinary field, it's common to see them use a single layer of perhaps 60% or even up to 90%, depending on how you want to select the sperm and, and what sort of quality you want to select. So you'll see lots and lots of reports in the veterinary fields of using a single layer of gradient media instead of using a, a discontinuous gradient. We don't tend to use that in the human field. Why? I'm not sure. I think it's just historic and, and it's, it's, it's out of habit. But it's true that it's certainly simple, simple to use. It's very quick. You do get an increased yield, but of course you've got to balance that increase, increased yield of sperm with the quality of the sperm. You may get an increased number, but they may not be of such high progressive motility and velocity. And what affects our yield? Well, certainly column height. As I said before, a lot of manufacturers will advocate the use of up to three mils, excuse me, three mils on a column. Um, basically, that means you're gonna to have to sediment the sperm through a larger amount of material, and this could affect your final yield. So I think if you've got an ejaculate that's uh, larger than two mils or significantly larger than two mils, you ought to consider maybe breaking that up into multiple gradients. And of course, you've got centrifugation that can affect yield. If you increase the G-force, increase the speed up to say 300, 400 G, you will pellet more sperm. And if you centrifuge for longer, you will pellet more sperm. But of course, you've got to balance that with the risk of pulling down more abnormal, more immotile sperm into the pellet. And then of course you've got the story about generating free oxygen radicals and oxidative stress. And there's, there's one or two reports first started to come out in the 1990s about G-forces up to about 500, um, generating increased levels of reactive oxygen species, and this could be potentially damaging to sperm. But that's a very complex story, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. But it's the reason why manufacturers now recommend a fairly gentle spin at about between 250 and 300 G. But of course, 
it's a balance because with having a very gentle spin, you do risk having a lot of sperm still retained in the supernate and, and not pulling down as many as you would like. So the free radical story is a complex one. I think that's the take home message from all this. It's not so clear cut. And if anybody wants to read a little bit more about it, or perhaps look at this paper here that's came out recently from Fabian Yao. It's true that reactive oxygen species, free oxygen radicals, and what you'd see quite often now is static oxidation reduction potential are all different measures and they're all measured in different ways. But it's certainly true that centrifugation is associated with poorer motility. It does affect motility negatively, and it does gener generate free oxygen radicals. But whether they are harmful or not to sperm at the time is actually not unknown. And nobody knows whether there's a threshold at which free oxygen radicals, reactive oxygen species do become harmful to sperm. And when we studied this with the um, Meoxys device, which measures static oxidation reduction potential, or basically the overall redox balance within a sample, we found some unusual results in that we found sperm, these are donor sperm, with higher velocity also had higher levels of uh, redox potential. So we, we found it a rather confusing picture and we think that this basically relates to increased metab metabolism amongst those sperm with higher velocity and higher motility. So it is very complex, the picture. So don't take it all at face value. And what I would take from that is that there's no evidence, evidence to suggest you couldn't push the centrifugation speed or time if you have a sample that might require it. So for example, you think the sample might be slightly poorer, you might want to push it to 400G or even slightly longer. What's probably more important with this whole story are the downstream events, such as lipid peroxidation of membranes and DNA, DNA fragmentation, which are downstream from those generation of free radicals. So just the presence of increased free radicals at the time don't necessarily result in abnormal um, damage sperm. What about the whole story between the effect that density gradient centrifugation has on DNA quality. Well, there's certainly plenty of evidence to support that, especially if you look hard enough. And this is a relatively recent paper that shows that in sperm that have been prepared on density gradients, uh, density gradients, obviously motility is increased, DNA fragmentation is reduced, and we've got here increased telomere length, which is a measure of sperm aging. And there's a paper down here, which was an earlier one, which I was involved with at the time, working with Denis Sackis um, some time ago, where we looked at DNA NICs using the tunnel assay. And we compared directly the swim up versus a, a gradient, uh, density gradient centrifugation, and looked at the number of DNA NICs in the final preparation and found that they're almost double in a swim up when compared to density gradient centrifugation. What about the story that suggests that there's a link between sperm DNA quality and sperm morphology? Well, there's less available on this, and I think that says something about our ability to assess abnormal and normal forms as it does anything else. But here's a recent paper looking at the relationship between morphology and DNA quality. And you can see clearly here from this graph that the, the higher levels of DNA fragmentation here are associated with low percentage of normal forms. And in fact, if you, if you read wide, more widely on this, you will see reports talking about DNA damage and spermatogenic anomalies. And most likely there is a relationship between the how sperm DNA is packaged. And there are some reports looking at higher ratios of histones to proteins in sperm with macrocephaly and, and um, head anomalies. So if we were to summarize um, uh, about the overall uh, quality of sperm obtained from either the swim up or the density gradient, using these eight criteria here, looking at cost, cost effectiveness, the yield, how long it takes to process, what's the risk of obtaining a poor, final preparation, the effects of centrifugation and so on. 
improved DNA, improved morphology. Density gradients seem to tick most of the boxes. And that's why it's really recognized as our industry standard, really. I'd like to talk a little bit now about performance testing your media used for density gradient centrifugation and the media that we wash and resuspend sperm in as well. What's the need for this? Well, basically, you've got to show that your media is fit for purpose. You've got an obligation to your patients. And now it's become it's become a regulatory requirement that we test everything. We validate media, we validate products before putting them into use. So you've got a, an obligation to certainly confirm what the manufacturer claims about the quality of their media. And of course, we have to test these media before we start using a new batch. The dilemma we've got really though is what endpoint do we use as a measure of performance? It's very difficult to use pregnancy rates and live birth rates as an endpoint because you've got ethical dilemmas, the trials are difficult to organize. And it's much easier to then just look at um, sa samples and look at the quality of the samples post preparation. So most people would look at donor sperm, for example, whether that's fresh or frozen sperm and look at a number of endpoints which relate to performance criteria. So when we're looking at the endpoint, obviously the, the main purpose of preparing sperm is to get a sperm suspension that is highly motile and has high, high velocity sperm. So that will be our primary endpoint. We could then look at things like yield calculations, so compare the ratio, concentration of motile sperm in the prepared, suspension compared to the original motile concentration. And if your motility measures are sufficiently robust, you can do some proper statistical comparisons. And of course, because sperm are temperature sensitive, this must all be done using temperature control. What about relying on traditional semen parameters? Well, here I'd just like to introduce the concept of measurement uncertainty, which is now quite significant in, in accreditation circles, where we're trying to look at the errors associated with all the little um, methods and nuances associated with sperm counts, sperm motility, and sperm morphology. And we know that, for example, sperm counts, um, the results you get do depend on what chamber you use. We do depend on how you use that counting chamber. We know that errors will occur because of the level of competence and training within your ind individual laboratory. And we know with some measures, particularly motility and morphology, we know that there's a degree of subjectivity associated with them. And of course, with motility, we know it's te sperm are temperature sensitive. So we must have a consistency when measuring sperm motility. So most laboratories will try and measure that at 37 degrees using a heated microscope stage. What kind of reassurance do we have that our semen, our traditional semen measures are reliable and reproducible? Well, I would say from these graphs here, from our EQA schemes, we don't really have much reassurance at all. Graph, a, re a return for sperm concentration, which shows wide variation in the sperm concentration read by multiple labs for the same given sample. And the same when you look at grade one motility, grade A motility, so rapid progressive sperm, wide variation across a number of labs for exactly the same sample. So this doesn't give us any reassurance that traditional semen parameters could be used as an, an endpoint, a useful endpoint when testing the performance of our culture media or our density gradient media. So I would suggest that traditional semen parameters may be useful for what I would call the assessment of adequacy. So in, for, ex for example, an extreme toxicity test, when you're testing, for example, the toxicity that a lubricant gel may, may have on sperm, you could use traditional semen parameters. But they are not sufficiently sensitive to use for measuring the performance of a culture media. Why do we need temperature control? Well, like I said, Progression, velocity is temperature sensitive. 
And if you look back in the WHO manual, going back 10 years, they say clearly that it's the extent of progression that is important and most related to pregnancy. So it's not all about how many sperm will swim forwards, it's about how well they swim and how fast they swim. So both progression and velocity are our primary performance indicators. And we know from a number of studies that sperm behave very differently in media at different temperatures, whether that's room temperature, roughly 25 degrees, or 37 degrees C. And that's illustrated really well by these two videos here. So you've got two samples here, both with um, progressive motility around 50%, but with a very different average velocity. This one is almost double this one, and as indicated by these red lines on the video here. And in fact, this is the same sample. All we've done with this sample is we've put this one in the fridge and taken it, taken it out and measured it soon after. And then for this one, we've just left it a bit longer. So these are the performance measure because of we, we've changed the temperature. So it's very important to use temperature control. So what can we use as our endpoints if we're going to use any kind of semen analysis as a performance criteria? Well, you've got to have an objective measure of sperm swimming speed for a start. You've got to use quantitative motility. And as I said at the start, I am an advocate for computer assessment computer assisted semen analysis. So you've got to have a reliable endpoint that's reliable, re reproducible, so quantitative measures of motility and velocity. And this is going to be time limited. So what the computer will do will limit the analysis to a single second, as opposed to us doing it manually, we might stare down the microscope for two or three minutes, by which time motile sperm have traveled into the field and out of the field Therefore, it just, it's natural that manual sperm motility measurements are, are overestimated. And then we've mentioned temperature control already. So that would be our primary endpoint because obviously we want our sperm preparation to be highly motile with fast swimming sperm. In terms of a secondary endpoint, we might consider things like looking at morphology. So examination of specific defects related to sperm preparation. And in this video, this is related to a, as an endpoint for looking at sperm that have been frozen and thawed and getting specific defects related to osmotic stress. We can consider things like viability, DNA fragmentation, free oxygen ra radicals again, and mitochondrial function, and possibly acrosome reaction. As long as these measures are reliable and reproducible, then they can be used as useful endpoints. So let's have a quick, quick look at uh, density gradient media. And this, this uh, experiment formed part of a master's project by one of our previous students, Claire Mitchell in Nottingham. And she started off by testing a number of commercially available uh, um, products used for density gradient centrifugation and showed pretty much that in terms of motility, grades A and B and sperm velocity, they perform pretty much the same. There's no real significant difference between any of the media that we tested. And then when she looked at downstream endpoints, so she looked here at um, overall redox balance, so static oxidation reduction potential, and DNA fragmentation, although there was some subtle difference between, between the, some of the media, there was no significant difference between any, any of them. But when we looked at sperm washing and resuspension buffer, we saw a slightly different story. And this was a, uh, formed the basis of another master's project of one of our students, uh, Nadia De Rosa. And she started off using some preliminary tests and started looking at some commercially available sperm washing buffers and noticed some enormous differences in their formulation, particularly with um, reference to pH bicarbonate levels, and the way that they were buffered. So with the help of Iridio, um, we managed to formulate some um, new test buffers with different bicarbonate and pH concentrations, and that formed the basis of Nadia's project. And what we saw was some quite startling differences between not only the 
commercially available media, but also the test media that we'd, we'd had formulated. And we noticed wide differences in, in performance based on velocity and progressive motility, but also some noticeable differences where they were measured at 25 degrees C. You see this slow drop off of velocity over a period of four hours. When compared to 37 degrees, where, where we saw in terms of progression and velocity, we saw peak performance seemed to be between two and three hours after incubation. So these were quite interesting results. And this basically prompted a deeper investigation. And again, with the help of, uh, from Origio at the time, they formulated another 24 media combinations for us with six bicarbonate and four different pH ranges. And we say, saw pretty much the same very consistent results with an association between these different media formulations and the content of bicarbonate and the pH. And we also looked at um, not only progression and velocity, but we looked at some secondary endpoints, DNA fragmentation and the acrosome reaction. And the results from these helped Origio at the time to take away the, the data, look at it statistically and go on to think about developing a new media based on optimal levels of bicarbonate, optimal pH. And they took that away and started thinking about producing a new media formulation. And this was to balance not only pH and bicarbonate, but look at the potential for early burnout. So we didn't want to see an early drop off of motility and velocity. And that was taken into account at the same time. Let's just finish off by talking very briefly about microfluidic devices. And that's just because they've become seemingly more popular. We see reports of them at conferences now and again. And again, this is science that's been borrowed from uh, other areas of laboratory science. And it's based on processing very small uh, volumes of fluid in very small channels. And this is the theory being that cells behave in very different ways. And we've seen devices based on, a, based on a number of principles, including Rio taxis, as we said before, this is swimming against a fluid flow. And you've got sperm swimming in a sort of obstacle course using a, a particular micro channel and different shapes and structures within that channel. And we've seen devices based on membrane uh, filtration as well. At the moment, we've not really seen an application that is particularly suited to these because they are using very small volumes. Possibly in the future, they may be developed to be very useful, for, for example, for surgically retrieved sperm. Uh, but at the moment, the sort of volumes we're dealing with on a daily basis using density gradients, most of these devices don't seem particularly suitable. So the advantages really are to be confirmed. But there are some markets on the, on, the, on the market that propose to be a microfluidic device, and there are some that are very close to market. And there's just one such example that um, professes to be a microfluidic chip. It's actually really a, a swim-up chip, um, and we've tested this quite thoroughly. The only microfluidic part component of the device is this chamber here. The, the seminal fluid is injected into this port and pushed along this channel here into a reservoir at the bottom of the chamber. Your clean uh, preparation media is put into this well at the top and basically the sperm swim up across this permeable membrane in the middle. And we've tested this quite thoroughly and found that yes, we get a clean prep, we get improved sperm velocity, we get improved sperm progression. But does that improvement justify the overall cost compared to a traditional swim up? We weren't entirely sure, basically. Um, certainly in terms of yield, it wasn't that much improved. And the, the comparison that we really needed to do, to do was to compare the chip with a density gradient centrifugation, not the traditional swim up because it's no longer our industry standard method. So just to summarize, it's pretty clear as to why density gradient centrifugation 
has become our industry standard, especially in terms of its overall cost and the risk of providing a poor quality end product. Based on process time and the overall yield and the quality of the, the sperm suspension in terms of motility and morphology and DNA quality, it seems justified. We found that all density gradient centrifugation products we've tested seem to perform very similarly, but we did find some startling differences amongst some of the sperm wash preparation buffers. And we thought and we felt and the results bear this out that it's related to the levels of bicarbonate and pH. You have a duty to very, sorry, you have a duty to verify and test new products when they come into the lab, and of course, new batches of, as, as well. And we have a shared responsibility, there's a shared responsibility between us as a laboratory and the manufacturer to make sure that when these are introduced, they are fit for purpose. And just lastly, microfluidic devices are yet to really prove themselves. They need an application and they also need proper validation and verification and, and to be shown that they are as good as density gradient centrifugation in all applications before you introduce them into routine use. I think that's it. I'd just like to acknowledge the, the projects, the master's projects of Nadia and Claire back in Nottingham. Um, and that's it. Thanks for your attention. Well, Matt, thank you very much indeed. I mean, that was a that was a fascinating, extremely comprehensive, extremely clear um, description of all the elements really that go into sperm preparation. Um, and you've provided justification, I think, for for what a lot of people in the audience do on a day to day basis. So, so that's fantastic. Thanks for that. Um, can I encourage um, the audience to put questions in the Q and A box? Um, if they have anything that, that they would like to uh, ask Matt in particular, but indeed um, Dave and uh, Stacey, and also if they'd like to come back and join the uh, join the panel, Matt, perhaps you could stop sharing your slides, please. That would sure. Be, Hang on. That'd be helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so um, yeah, there's a number of questions that have that have popped up here. Um, I'll I'll start with the one that I think is most interesting. Um, the the work which Nadia did um, around sperm wash buffers and the importance of the bicarb concentration or the, the difference that the bicarb concentration and the pH has um, is really interesting stuff. And it, and it makes, makes me think certainly about sperm washing more than I have done before. Um, but why, fundamentally, the, the question is, why is the pH um, so important to sperm physiology? Why are we bothering? Well, definitely, the, um, when we first tested them, the very, very low pH media, and there were, there were one or two that were only just above neutral, um, obviously led to, to poor progression and, and, and poor velocity. Um, and, and clearly, if you look at the, the, the female reproductive tract, it, it's, it's generally the higher, the further away you get away from the cervix, the, the higher the pH. So clearly you want to, something that mimics a more alkali pH. And, and um, I mean, I'm not an expert in, in, in IVF at all, but I know again that, that, that um, when you're dealing with IVF, you want, you want to mimic a more alkali pH. Um, yes, more acidic pH will kill sperm, you know, just, just like the, the environment in the vagina, which kills sperm. You get past that, you're looking at a more alkali environment. And I think generally we were surprised at how, how high you could push it. Um, you know, you were looking at 8.3, 8.5 being a more, um, more satisfactory environment for, for sperm swimming speed and progression. And it was very obvious. So, so I guess in, in the context of this sort of marginal gains, approach that we're, we're broadly discussing here, um, getting that pH and, and using the correct sperm wash buffer is important, isn't it? Yeah, and I, I don't really know what happens at, at the point where you, where you mix the sperm suspension 
in IVF, but obviously I'm I'm an andrologist, therefore my uh, my limitations are, are are to things like insemination. But it, it's it's very clear that if if we assume that the concentration of motile sperm, the percentage progression, and, and more importantly, the velocity of sperm is important for not only natural pregnancy, uh, pregnancy by insemination and by IVF, there's a better relationship between those parameters and outcome, then, then we have to provide an, an environment that, that promotes that. Okay. Um, just leading on from this, I guess, there's a question here. Um, did you look into the relationship between capacitation and bicarb slash pH in the sperm wash media? Well, we don't really have any firm measure of capacitation. I mean, there are an enormous uh, number of different things tried to measure capacitation, but there's nothing that's particularly quantitative. All you can look at it, uh, are really um, patterns of motility as you incubate for longer and longer. But to create capacitating conditions, you they have to be quite specific. You know, you're looking at long incubation times, specific concentration of albumin, things like that. Um, and I don't think we were we were particularly pushing them that hard. So yes, you've got to allow sperm to capacitate and they do change their motility behavior over time. But in these buffers, we were still seeing mainly linear progressive motility, not the kind of thrashing about and, and high amplitude motility that you see with capacitating sperm. So yeah, I mean, the longer you leave them, the more, the more capacitation you will observe, but again, We've not got a really objective measure of capacitation. No, fair enough. Um, so here's a really a very practical question, um, which I think I'll ask to all three panelists. Uh, what's the best method to maximise recovery from very viscous samples? So who'd like to go first? Um, Dave. Oh, thanks, Steve. Um, <laughs> It's a, it's a good question. I mean, I've I've tended to um, stick fairly rigidly to using a, a, a density gradient as as um, as as Matt described. Um, I, I'm not a particularly big fan of of drawing samples through needles, um, and I've never used any chemical methods. You can use uh, uh, bromelain, I think it is, isn't it? Um, but I'm not. I'm not too sure about that. I, what what I've tended to do with samples like that, where I'm concerned that yield might be compromised in some way, um, is to set up multiple gradients and reduce the volume on each, rather than try to mess around with the sample itself. I don't know whether that's different for other people. No, I think that, that, that's a fair point, and I would also. I mean, it was routine uh, for us back in the day to push the the central ligation up to as far as 400G. Um, it stands to reason with a high viscosity fluid or with more protein in it, it will take longer to sediment. Um, so pushing the central ligation up, up a notch seems to improve yield. But I think in, in my experience, I, I don't find a big problem with separating high viscosity samples. I think it's a bigger problem for swim up because you get a real problem at the interface and you get the protein being pulled up into the media layer, and that can cause a lot of problems. I think that's why the density gradient is so good. And it's a bigger problem when you're when you're preparing sperm for freezing because the high protein content and the hyperviscosity prevents mixing of the sperm with cryoprotectant. So it's another reason for why you might consider, in some instances, preparing sperm before you freeze them. Okay, and and Stacey, you you. You're probably the one that's worked in um, in proper clinical practice most recently. How did you deal with viscous samples? In the way that's already been described, you might give them a little bit longer to, to liquefy, possibly. Obviously, we wouldn't push that too far. Um, and then multiple gradients and obviously do your best because we all know they can be a little bit trickier to handle. <laughs> yep, sure. And then it's, just it's worth saying, Steve, that 
sorry. No, go ahead. Just quickly, it's worth saying, Steve, that, that, that although there aren't many systematic experiments out there, the use of things like chymotrypsin does take away the viscosity. And from what I've seen in some very small scale trials, does allow the sperm to swim better as well. Uh, a lot of people are a bit worried about the motility using things like chymotrypsin. But in my experience, you take away that high level of protein and viscosity and the sperm swim more freely. Okay. So here's, here's another practical question. Um, and it, it relates to a lot of what you've discussed about actually. Um, and, and this is how many sperm washes should you do optimally? Um, so perhaps Matt, from your from a, an experimental perspective, what do you think the answer to that is? Well, I'm coming at it from an andrologist perspective and the fact that we're, I'm talking about inseminations rather than IVF. I think you've got to balance the increased yield you might get from washing only once with how clean the preparation is, with the fact that you are maybe potentially, as I said, the, the story is complex, you, you're potentially damaging sperm by int introducing yet another centrifugation step. So that would be, you know, there's a trade-off there. There's a, there's a trade-off between centrifuging too many times and risking damaging sperm. And certainly for insemination, my experience is one wash is nearly always sufficient. Okay, um, Dave, do you have a view? Yeah, this this is an interesting one because I've always recommended two washes after uh, a gradient for um, IVF and ICSI samples. I, t I take entirely what Matt's saying in terms of IUI because I think it's less um, critical. I, I know plenty of labs do one wash for IVF samples, and it, and it might come down to some extent to to, to volumes. And again, the the risk and benefit that Matt describes comes into the equation there. So if you want to reduce to one wash, but wash with a larger volume, you might need to spin for longer in order to make sure you're recovering as many of the sperm. And then you've got the duration of centrifugation potentially being a risk. So that, honestly, I don't know whether we're really sure whether one or two washes is, is optimal. Um, and it might vary on total exposure to, to centrifugal stress, if, if that's yeah. a, a correct term. Um, I would stick to the recommendation of two washes if I'm doing IVF or ICSI, but it's based on fairly um, fairly flimsy evidence. There's a couple of papers, but it isn't particularly strong data, I don't think. Okay, and, and Stacey, in your recent clinical practice, how many washes were you doing? I've done a bit of both, depending on where I've worked and the protocols that we've been using. Uh, I think as well, you, you know, it's how you prepare your sample, isn't it? You're going to get a cleaner sample if you probably take off your gradients and remove the palate, as opposed to going through your gradients with a pasta pipette. So, you know, there might be little things like that we can look at in our sperm preps that may increase the overall cleanliness. Yeah, it's all in also worth saying. Sorry, sorry, Stacey. That's it's right. also worth saying that at 300 G. It's a really relatively gentle spin. You will still leave sperm in the supernatant. You know, you, you, if you worry about yield, then the more you centrifuge, the more times you're going to lose more sperm. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, okay, well, a, another question leading on from that. Maximum centrifuge speed. What, what's what's the, the hardest you can spin sperm at, do you think, Matt? Well, it all, all goes back to the complexity of that free radical story. In our experience using um, static oxidation reduction potential as, a, as an endpoint measure, um, we found little difference in that endpoint, whether you did 300G, 400G, 600G. But having said that, I'm not convinced that is necessarily the right measure of generating free oxygen radicals. It's a, it's a different measure. I know people are using it widely. But if you go back to some of the older experiments where they use things like luminometry, which was more uh, a measure of the active radicals that are knocking about in the sperm suspension, 
it's slightly different. I, I think there's definitely a relationship between highest um, centrifugation speeds and sperm damage. I'm, I'm convinced of that. But at the lower end, you know, certainly between things like 300 and 400 G, there's little or no evidence. You're talking about pushing it higher. Um, and and my, my own feeling is that if I was worried about yield, as we've just talked about with viscous samples or something like that, I may want to push it higher to say 400 G because there's no evidence to suggest that it's going to cause any more damage. Yeah. Dave, are you aware of any evidence in the literature that, that tells us how fast we can spin sperm? I seem to remember something from, from Belgium years ago where you could spin up to something like 1200 G without causing any damage, yeah. but I don't recall what the markers were. Yeah, and, and yes, that's a, that's a fair point, Steve. I think if you look at the IFUs, I think Matt showed the, the diagram with 300 to 500 G, which I think is, is in, in one of our instructions for use. As a, as a matter of routine, I tend to, to follow what Matt has said, and, and the, the 300G is what I would typically use. I recall in the in the early days of, of ICSI, when we were concerned about pulling sperm down into the pallet for, for the severe oligos and the cryptozoospermic samples, that we were using 1800G. And we didn't think too much about it there, and, and primarily because again it comes back to the same argument the 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 benefits of that were that you got a reasonable number of sperm to work with and we we offset that against the risks of spinning them too hard and damaging them but i seem to recall the outcomes were reasonable um but i don't know that we are much the wiser about a genuine cutoff for centrifugation speed beyond general advice that you know, the, the slower you spin it, the better, but the, the risk is that you lose some of your sperm. So for the normal zoospermics and the, the moderate oligozoospermics that we, we tend to see more of, that 300G is a, is a reasonable compromise, I think. But I don't think we have a definite threshold for where damage really ramps up. OK, and then perhaps looking to the future here, there's a question that that's asking whether we think microfluidics could have a place when preparing um, oligospermic frozen samples, straws specifically for treatment, bearing in mind the volume is quite small in comparison to a neat sample. Dave? Uh, well, it, yes, it'll have a place, absolutely. But but I think that, that for me sounds like a perfect scenario for using a density gradient, but because there you're likely to maximize the yield um so with careful preparation of a density gradient given that it's frozen um frozen thawed you, you need to factor in a little bit the way you prepare the frozen sample before you put it on the gradient to minimize any osmotic shock um but i i wouldn't necessarily choose a microfluidic device for that i mean the microfluidic devices for for to my mind, are more suited where, um, for example, you either haven't got the technical expertise or the equipment to do a standard prep. So, for example, it doesn't tend to be something you see particularly in the UK and Irish markets, but in some areas where you, you want to do a, a sperm prep in the doctor's office almost, um, loading up a microfluidic device, taking off the supernatant after an hour and putting it into an IUI catheter <clears throat> would probably work pretty well, I imagine. Yeah, sure. Um, Matt, do you have a view on this? We are almost out of time, I'm afraid. So if you could yeah, make a quick... Yeah, quick much more to say than, um, than Dave said, really. I'd really like to see the data beyond the kind of things we've seen so far, comparing a swim-up chip with standard swim-up. That, that, to me, is a difficult... A difficult comparison. I think I'd really like to see it from true microfluidic devices, and maybe there will be a place for them for something like um, frozen sperm. You know, you like you said, you uh, what we do at the moment with frozen sperm is not great because we do manage to kill an awful lot of the sperm in when we re remove the cryoprotectant and thaw them. So there might be a gentler way of treating them, and um, but we've got to see the data yet. 
Okay, yeah, and it's it's interesting. There's a comment about um, the uh, ESHRA um, uh, good practice recommendations for add-ons, which is out, I think, for consultation at the moment. Um, and that cites some data around microfluidic chambers uh, possibly improving outcome. Um, but it does seem to be just one paper with a relatively low number of, uh, um, of patients in it. Um, okay, so um, we'll have this as the last question. It's slightly, um, uh, slightly off the wall. My apologies to the person asking the question, but would you consider sperm preparation key to internal verification of consumables used for andrology diagnostics and treatment rather than the approach taken by the WHO 2021, which advocates neat samples? Or would you prefer to see an alternative approach that uses a combination or a novel method? So this is about QC testing that. Yeah, I think it's an interesting point. It's come up before, especially I, I remember we wrote something on it for ABA a few years ago. Um, there's two sides to the argument. The problem is with, with using seminal fluid as your, your standard is that there's no standard seminal fluid. We know that the biochemistry of seminal fluid changes between patients. It also changes between ejaculates from the same patient. So if that biochemistry is going to change, that's going to change in terms of the response that sperm have when they're when they're incubated with them in terms of the toxicity response so my own feeling is if you want to try and normalize a toxicity test make it a true standard test you've got to have a standard media and i find that it's a difficult argument to to kind of win really i do see the argument from the other side because you know when you're testing sperm they're generally in semen um but there's no standard semen and I, and I think there's an argument for both, if I'm honest. Okay, great. I think we'll um, we'll end it there um, in terms of questions. I'll hand over to uh, Emily. There are a, a few questions that haven't been answered, um, and I'm sure that the the panel will will get to those via email if people would like to email those in. Um, so, Emily, thank you. Thank you. Loving the huge number of questions today. That's been brilliant. So a uh, huge thank you to our special guest, Matt, for joining us today. We, we very much appreciate you giving us your time today. And for Matt having the allure, wanting so many delegates to tune in. Uh, also, thank you very much to Dave and Stacey for joining the Q&A panel this afternoon and to Steve for chairing today's session. Thank you. Also, thank you very much to Tenna. You can't see her, but she's there in the background. She's done all the organisation work for this webinar and has been our, our web hostmaster today, ensuring that everything runs smoothly. So thank you, Tenna. If there are any lab or theatre procedures or aspects of fertility that you would like us to cover in a webinar or a live person event, because we do also like seeing you in person, please do let us know. You can either contact your account manager or email us at customerserviceuk at coopersurgical.com. And if you'd like more information on any of the other many webinars and events that we run, please also email the same address, customerserviceuk at coopersurgical.com. They'll sign you up to our fortnightly bulletin where you can hear all about what we have going on. So it just remains for me to say thank you so very much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to have your company and thank you again for those questions. And we look forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you.